Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion traces its origin to the arrival of the Christian Missionary Society in the 19th century during the British colonial rule. The Anglican Church took root in Nigeria through the efforts of missionaries and the establishment of missions and churches. The Church of Nigeria was initially part of the Church of England's province of West Africa. As the Anglican Communion grew in Nigeria, there was a desire for greater autonomy and independence. This culminated in the formation of the Church of Nigeria as an independent province within the Anglican Communion. In 1979, the Church of Nigeria officially became an independent province distinct from the province of West Africa. This development marked a significant milestone in the Church's history granting its great self-governance and the ability to shape its own policies and practices. Since gaining autonomy, the Church of Nigeria, Anglican Communion, has continued to grow and evolve, playing a crucial role in the religious landscape of Nigeria and participating actively in the global Anglican Communion. The Anglican Communion is organized into regional churches we call provinces. Because we are all over the world, it is not possible to have just one person in Canterbury overseeing the entire communion. So you have provinces each one with its own ambition. The province of West Africa um, was led by Andrew Scott. And in time, under God's grace, the fathers of the church in Nigeria felt it. That it was time for them to become independent of West Africa. So they applied to the Anglican Communion Office in the UK, called ACC, Anglican Council Council. And the matter was discussed, debated, and eventually approved. So, following the approval by the ACC, in February 1979, this church came into being with um, late Baba Olofo Soye as the first archbishop and primate of this church. Yes, back then, um, there were laid down principles. Um, for instance, one of the policies was that for a church to be established, for a church to claim to be a church, a dance, a province, or whatever, it would be self administering self propagating and self-funding. Um, those three principles were sacrosanct back then. And at the time when uh, the church of Nigeria came into pay, there were 16 dioceses in Nigeria already. So those 16 dioceses were strong enough to merge, to become a prophet. Um, in, in this country, not long ago, we created internet provinces. And the, I think the standard was that uh, there must be at least eight dioceses or nine to become an internal province. But to become a national uh, province, uh, and then you have to have more than that. So we qualified. We qualified to be a province. And like I said, a request was made. It was debated. It was approved. And the Agent of Canterbury had to give effect to the decision of the ACC. That's what happened. And um, of course, if there were only for there, a very strong man in the communion, 
very, very strong in the community. Um, there was nothing to, to worry about. We to fear at that time. Uh, we had everything going for him. Uh, we had the people, we had the resources, so it was done. He was the provost of the cathedral I know. We were very close. I was in Leoluji. Then later we went to work under, almost under him. Um, you see, many people, we need to learn lessons from this. You will not like it because it was a clever diplomacy to remove him from Nigeria. There was no place he could easily stay in Nigeria as bishop. He was a very dynamic man, a, a highly gifted man. If uh, if you were with Olufo uh, Soye, whom I knew as provost, if you were talking from morning to evening, you would not be tired listening to him. He was highly gifted. He had the gift of the gab. So, but at the same time, he was very tough. No, was tough. So that he was, I, I think, uh, you see, when God wants to do something wonderful in, in many people's lives, he will begin with difficulty. You say, oh, this is difficult. This is uh, you, you, as if it's, it's in that it's painful, but in the long run. God prepared him for it. And he went there by going to Gambia and Rio Pongas. He was able to meet, make contact with many bishops in West Africa. Look at it. Because when he came back, 19, um, as Bishop of Ibadan, on the retirement of uh, Bishop Elsie Ogutola, when he came back, later he was to be uh, the Archbishop. You know, he, this, even by his coming back, you know, other people that he had met in West Africa, they were both for his uh, election as this, as that, and so on. He later became Archbishop, province of Nigeria, 1979. At that time, I was lecturer at the University of George. And I was also the, the Dalsitian secretary, senior secretary in George. I was the first one. So, um, later, you could see the situation. When he finished, by 1986 or so, when um, Adit Loye yeah. became Archbishop. You see, one thing that I, I see in the situation of life, as, as far as um, the appointments are concerned, is that um, God uses people, his own people for certain purposes. There is no one that uh, if you come across God, that he doesn't have a purpose for you. If you encounter God, he will reveal it to you. Uh -huh. So this was what happened. And under him, under Bishop Olufo Soye, the Church of Nigeria really was very dynamic. But in organization, yes, was a wonderful organizer. Um, we need to really understand the scriptures. We are surrounded by millions of witnesses. Um, it is not a new thing, persecution, difficulties, and so on. All these are fleeting, passing by. If only we can focus our attention on Jesus and put aside all these besetting sins, all things that lead us easily. We are reading the, the book of uh, Amos now in the Daily Guide. Is this time that I, I, I think I follow it more closely than ever before? Is a book of judgment. 
Even in chapter 8, we read today that God, because he will not be partial, he will punish his own children, the Jews, as he will punish other people. I believe we should continue to emphasize the teaching of the word. The teaching of the word. And all the churches have had the opportunity to work. Bible study is primary. My conclusion is very simple. I don't have the wisdom to moderate the life of these people. But the word of God will do it. Yes, I was a final year student at Emmanuel College. And uh, that same year, later in October, I got admission to the University of Ibadan. Those were the two things that happened in my life. I was made a deacon. I became a deacon in 79. After graduating from Emmanuel College, then I, I was sent to Joss as a, a young priest, a young uh, clergyman, a, a deacon. And uh, later that same year, I went to Ibadan to resume as a young undergraduate. It was explained to us because some of us actually did not get the full meaning of it as students. They said, um, this uh, our bishop, then the archbishop, MCO Scott, the most reverend MCO Scott, will no longer be the head of our church. I say, why? Say, because we are going to be a, a separate province from the Church of West Africa. You see, it's a misconception or a misunderstanding of what the Christian church is asking for. It's not about your village. It's not about your traditional religion. Because all over the world, people had their religions. But Christianity was a gift to mankind and Whatever variant of Christianity you are practicing, by which I mean denomination, um, it is given to man, not man making it. It's not made by man. That's why sometimes the theology, the Christian theology is difficult for some people to understand. And when they find it difficult, they go back to their, begin to say many things. Uh, I congratulate myself because we were the first products of the Church of Nigeria in 1979 as a deacon. I was made deacon in 79. And since then, I have been in the Church of Nigeria. So I, we, our generation and those after us and our members of the church, we congratulate everyone and we congratulate the leadership of today and all the lay leadership uh, clergy our bishops our primates living or late we thank them for leading us to this point But 
you and me know that even the most brilliant of the scientists know that there are questions they cannot answer because God is God. He owns this world, he made it, he sustains it by the power of his word. And at the end, Jesus is coming back again to harvest this world. Whether they like it or not, each one of us will stand before him to answer. Let us return back to the Lord. He may have allowed us to go through this hard time, but he will heal us. He will restore us. He will show us mercy. And that is what we want to tell our young people. The future is for you. Don't give it up. Difficulties and challenges are part and parcel of life. But God is faithful that when we trust him and depend upon him and his word, he has always proved himself. And he will never fail us in our generation. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we will continue to hope and trust in him. So don't give up your hope in him. If you are hoping for something that you have seen, you, there is no more hope. But when we are expecting God, let us hold on to faith, to, to love, to hope, and persevere. The Lord will surely remember us. Weeping and crying may endure for the night, as the scripture says, but joy comes in the morning. And I'm believing God that the Lord will remember us. We want to rejoice with all our church fathers, the bishops and bishops, all our clergy and their families, all our lay members, the Anglican faithfuls, wonderful people of God who have trusted this God and have stood their ground both to bear the burden and to pray, to hope, and to labor for God's kingdom. These have been 45 wonderful years of testimonies of the faithfulness of God. And as the Lord leads us into the future, let us keep our eyes on Him. Let us stand strong in His grace and power and strength. And let us go all the way with the Lord into the future. The church has a great future. And both this generation and the oncoming generation must depend on this God. And as we lead them into that, may God go ahead of us. Happy anniversary and God bless.